All right, there we go. So welcome everybody. Um, today's topic is electric vehicle programs and incentives for your business. My name is Dominique. I'm the climate programs coordinator with High Country Conservation Center. We are an environmental nonprofit in Frisco focused on energy efficiency, climate action, water conservation, and waste reduction. So we'll just take a look at our agenda today before we jump in. So today we'll hear from a few speakers who will discuss our local electric vehicle readiness plan and goals. We'll talk about Charge Ahead Colorado grants and Excel Energy programs for your business. And before our speakers introduce themselves, I wanted to go over a couple housekeeping items on the next slide. So at the end of the workshop, we're going to have a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. And to ask a question, you can use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen, or you can click the raise hand button and that will alert me to unmute you. So if you'd rather ask your question um, over the speaker. We will share any links or resources uh, through the chat function today. And we will send out the presentation slides and the workshop recording to everyone who registered today. So I think with that, we can do a quick introduction um, of our panelists, um, maybe just your name, where you work, um, your role, and we'll just start with you, Jess. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jess Hoover, and I am the Climate Action Director with the High Country Conservation Center. I work with Dom. Hi, everyone. My name is Stefan Johnson, and I'm the Transportation Program Manager for CLEAR, or Clean Energy Economy for the Region. We're also an environmental nonprofit and energy consultancy based in Carbondale, Colorado, and I'm also one of the recharge coaches for the state of Colorado and the Colorado Energy Office. Hey, I'm Brandon Bickness. I work on Excel Energy's electric transportation team as a product portfolio manager. My focus is on our multifamily and commercial programs. All right, thanks everybody. Um, so I think we can just jump right in and Jess is gonna give us an overview of our Summit EV Readiness Plan. Take it away, Jess. Thanks, Dom. Okay, so I'm gonna back up a little bit just to give everyone some context for what has been happening in Summit County that led us to creating an electric vehicle readiness plan. Uh, in 2018, HC3 convened a group of multiple community stakeholders, including local governments, the ski areas, some other prominent businesses, um, CMC and the school district to create a climate action plan for the Summit County community. And this plan has uh, two part goals. Um, First, to decrease local greenhouse gas emissions 50% by 2030, and ultimately to decrease greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050, which are in line with goals um, in many other communities, as well as the state of Colorado. And if you're paying attention to recent climate news and the latest IPCC report, perhaps aren't even aggressive enough, but it's our starting point. Um, so we did a greenhouse gas emissions inventory when we were creating the plan so we could figure out where we were starting from. And this inventory showed us that one third of carbon emissions created within Summit County come from transportation. Um, and we modeled a ton of strategies as we were creating the plan and looking at transportation, a widespread adoption of electric vehicles is our biggest lever for decreasing these local transportation emissions. Um, and so it's a key strategy in the climate action plan and then in this EV readiness plan that we just finished to really help push this electric vehicle transition forward. And so we have a goal also of having 10,000 EVs registered in the county by 2030, which is also pretty aggressive given that we have just a just shy of 300 right now. Um, but we're really hoping that with goals from Excel Energy and from the state and potential new transportation funding, that it will really be a kickstart to helping us meet these goals. So as I mentioned, we knew that a widespread adoption of EVs was really going to be fundamental for helping us decrease local, uh, local transportation emissions. And so creating an electric vehicle readiness plan was a key strategy 
included in the Climate Action Plan. And last year, we started a, another stakeholder process to create a, um, an electric vehicle readiness plan for the county. Um, we had support from Excel Energy. We had consultants working with us um, to help us pick the strategies that would have the biggest impact. And the result is a document that you can access online. It's on HC3's website um, that has 20 strategies across five different categories designed to make driving, owning, and riding, and charging an electric car easier and more convenient for people in Summit County. Um, kind of a fun fact is that Summit County, outside of California, um, is within the top 15 communities nationwide for EV adoption, which is really exciting. And we also know that there are some front range communities on that list too. So not only is it our locals who are more often, more and more locals who are buying these cars, but also front range visitors who you know, are buying them too and will ultimately want to be able to drive up to the county and find a place to plug in and then visit your businesses. Um, so we're really excited about the plan. Um, really happy to have all of you on the call today because we do need your support to help make this transition a reality. Another goal in the plan is to have over 400 publicly accessible charging plugs across the county by 2030. That means plugs at businesses, um, plugs at multifamily housing buildings, um, you know, plugs that you might install for your employees. So if they have an EV that they can charge during work or your customers can use them too. This is really necessary for people to feel confident that they can charge on the go, especially visitors from out of the community. Um, so that's, that's one small thing that, that local business owners can do to help us achieve the goals of this plan is to help us provide charging infrastructure for folks. Um, and so we're excited to hear from our other panelists today. And during the Q&A, if anyone has questions about the Climate Action Plan or the EV Readiness Plan, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thanks, Dom. Thanks, Jess. Um, Jess, if you want to, at some point, you can throw the uh, link to the EV plan in the chat. Thank you. Um, Stefan, I think that you are up next with Charge Ahead Colorado Grants. Excellent. Thanks so much, Dom. Um, we can immediately move on to the next slide. So uh, CLEAR is one of the five recharge organizations, which is a program affiliated with the state of Colorado's energy office. And the program is designed to help the state uh, reach its EV goals. And there's kind of two main uh, buckets in which uh, the recharge program works. One is aimed at general consumer uh, education. And so that works um, in you know, hosting electric vehicle riding drives as we plan to do and have done in partnership with High Country Conservation Center in the past, working with dealerships on um, promoting electric vehicles, training their sales staff, and even doing limited time electric vehicle group buys. And then the other segment is really focused on uh, infrastructure deployment. You know, as Jess alluded to, uh, increasing the number of publicly accessible EV charging stations is going to be absolutely crucial to EV adoption going forward. And it's also going to be really important for a few other things, such as fleets and such as, um, you know, even being competitive as a business or in the case of, you know, many mountain resort communities offering EV charging as an amenity if you're a condo association. And we've seen lots of interest uh, going up from condo associations and adding EV chargers to their property so that they can retain their tenants and also be one of the more attractive um, kind of lodging uh, facilities going into the future. And so Clear's territory where, where I operate and uh, help provide this sort of EV coaching and technical assistance is a 14 county region uh, that you see there in orange that is most of the sort of northern portion northwestern corner of Colorado and the western slope and Summit County is on the very edge. Next slide please. So one of the best opportunities for businesses to help spur uh, you know the, the adoption of electric vehicles and get some really great financial and technical assistance is through the Charge Ahead Colorado grant opportunity. 
So this makes uh, competitive grants available to help offset the cost of purchasing and installing EV charging stations for um, uh, different real estate locations and, and, and companies or nonprofits or even local governments. And I really do wanna place an emphasis on the fact that this funding is competitive. Um, in, in recent rounds, even in the year of the pandemic, the number of requests for funding that have been received by the energy office uh, far exceed the allocated funding for each kind of round. Um, so I just share this so that everyone knows that it is a competitive process and that um, putting your due diligence into preparing an application is definitely recommended. But the good news is there's lots of resources to help anyone that's interested in the grant um, figure out how to create the best application possible. And um, I'm one of those resources where I would be happy to assist any sort of business or location, evaluate whether the grant is a good match for you and offer grant writing assistance and, and general recommendations. Um, there are three grant cycles annually. So this really is, is great in that even if you miss the most recent cycle, which was in May, June, there's usually one right around the corner. So um, typically there's a grant cycle at the beginning of the year in the January, February timeframe, one in May, June, one in September, October. Next slide, please. So the way the grant works in terms of the amount is the energy office will fund 80% of the total cost of the project or a, um, a set maximum for each of the different kind of levels of, in char of charging they're, in they're incentivizing. So the max grant they will award for a fleet only charging station is $6,000, uh, $9,000 for a dual port level two station, $35,000 for a level three station that is between 50 and 100 kilowatts maximum power, and then $50,000 for an ultra fast level three charger. And I highlighted the fleet only charging um, incentive, which is lower, um, but I'm gonna come back to that with a special case study of how I've seen some businesses that are thinking about um, providing charging for their own vehicles, but then also making those chargers accessible to the public and therefore qualifying for the full $9,000 for each dual port level two station. I also really wanna highlight that uh, this program and these incentives can be combined with other opportunities. Um, it's not either or, it's uh, both and. So we're gonna hear a little bit later from Brandon about some of Excel's amazing programs. Those can be combined with the Charge Ahead program as well. And then there are even some federal tax credits that make this uh, more financially viable for businesses looking to add EV charging to their location. Next slide, please. So really quickly, uh, there, there are certain types of projects that you know, uh, are prioritized above others by the state. And these include entities that can't take it advantage of some of the tax incentives. And so these would be nonprofits, schools, and local governments. And then in terms of other kind of key areas where they really want to uh, incentivize charging in order to you know, accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, there's a really big push for Colorado to continue to have a strong tourism industry, but to have it um, exist in a sustainable and low impact way. So uh, there's been a big emphasis on electrifying scenic byways so that Colorado locals and visitors alike would be able to take an electric vehicle anywhere in the state, rural areas, uh, urban areas, and of course our you know, many state parks and national parks and really beautiful scenic locations. And, visit those environmental places without further contributing to climate change. Um, and then two of the other really big ones are workplaces are highly encouraged to apply. Uh, there's a lot of data that shows that workplaces that offer EV charging as an amenity, uh, employees there are something like 20 times more likely to have an electric vehicle. And then multifamily housing developments are also really highly encouraged to apply. Lots of EV drivers that have uh, single family homes are able to easily install their own level two charger and charge overnight as most people do. Multifamily housing is a bit trickier. So uh, there's a big 
there's a big priority to get more charging into multifamily housing developments. Next slide, please. So, you know, as I spoke with a little bit earlier, um, I've seen a really big increase in interest from uh, commercial fleets, especially when they saw some of the press around the new all electric Ford F-150 and the different uh, kind of the price and the different performance specs associated with the truck. There's been a massive surge in interest in businesses looking to transition their fleet to electric vehicles. And one of those companies is uh, an environmental and disaster restoration company called Ecos Environmental. They have multiple offices spread across Colorado, some in Steamboat Springs, some in Aspen near me, uh, some in Colorado, Colorado Springs and some um, in Denver and along the Front Range. And so they have several of these uh, all electric Ford F-150s on order and they needed to start thinking about their infrastructure strategy. And what they figured out that they would wanna do is they would be able to charge their fleet vehicles overnight and then make the charger publicly accessible during business hours uh, during the day. So from 9, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, they will have that charger open and available to the public. And then overnight, they will have them exclusively reserved for their own fleet. And that's a way in which they were able to apply for and receive the full $9,000 per level two port station. So some commercial businesses that have really a lot of vehicle miles traveled and uh, lots of different cycle, cycling needs might not be able to do that and would need to keep their chargers exclusively for fleet. But for lots of uh, fleets, I think there is the opportunity to have this hybrid model where they're gonna be able to make the chargers publicly accessible during certain hours and then make them exclusive to their own fleet during um, nighttime for the, for the most part. Next slide, please. Real quick, I just wanted to highlight some of the additional incentives that can uh, be combined on top of ChargerHead to, to make you know, the adoption of electric vehicles more attractive. There's also a federal tax credit for installing EV charging stations. This uh, was just extended uh, through the end of 2021. It was set to expire at the end of 2020, but luckily it has been extended through this year. And so, if you're a business, you can claim a federal tax credit up to 30% of the project cost, maxing out at $30,000 if you get your charging infrastructure installed by the end of the year. And again, this can be combined with uh, Charge Ahead and Excel programs. It is not limited um, to you know, an either or kind of incentive. Next slide, please. Then really quickly for, for the vehicles, Colorado continues to have some of the best state tax credits and incentives for the adoption of electric vehicles. So there you can kind of see the breakdown of what's on offer for different vehicle classes. Um, the heavier the vehicle, the larger the incentive because it's related to the battery size and those vehicles are heavy duty electric vehicles are much more expensive, hence the larger um, the larger tax credit. And it's really nice to note that even if a business doesn't have tax liability, uh, this, this tax credit will be issued to you as a refund. So even if you've um, zeroed out all your taxes or through all the deductions, you don't have um, a $5,000 tax liability, you will still receive all of that um, benefit by, by taking advantage of the tax credit. Next slide, please. Whereas the federal tax credit for electric vehicles, you do need the tax appetite. You must have that tax liability to um, claim the tax credit. And the way the ta that tax credit works is um, $7,500 for all electric vehicles with the exception of Tesla and Chevrolet. They have maxed out the 200,000 vehicle quota um, that the policy was designed. So once you sell 200,000 vehicles, with that tax credit, you are no longer eligible for it, but pretty much every other automotive manufacturer is continues to be eligible for the tax credit. So Ford, uh, Nissan, BMW, um, the list goes on. No one else has hit that cap. Nissan is probably going to be the closest um, to hitting that cap in the near future. And you know, there's consistently talk 
amongst Washington policy circles about the electric vehicle tax credit being revised, but there is no um, guarantee that that will happen. So these are the incentives as they currently exist. For plug-in hybrid vehicles, the incentive is less and it's correlated to the size of the battery. So in the case of a Mitsubishi Outlander, which is a plug-in hybrid vehicle pictured here, the amount is $5,800. Next slide, please. And uh, I know I went over a lot of this information quickly, but one great you know, one-stop shop for electric vehicle info that I would recommend um, any participants to uh, learn more and, and dive into the details or revisit some of the amounts and incentives is Drive Electric Colorado. So if you go to driveelectriccolorado.org, there's lots of great information on that website about tax credits, about incentives, um, even with, they even have a page with local dealerships in Colorado and what special discounts or special pricing they're providing for their electric vehicles. There's lots of great blog articles on navigating charging infrastructure, installing a home charger. Um, it really is a great resource for both individuals and businesses alike to think about transitioning to EVs. And so if anyone has any questions about um, primarily the Charge Ahead program, but any of the other topics associated with EVs, I would uh, welcome you to reach out to me and my email address is listed right there. And that concludes my presentation. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I am, it looks like you actually might have a question and since we're ahead, um, maybe I'll, I'll go ahead and unmute Bill real quick. Um, Bill, do you have a question? You can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask. Um, will all of these slides be available to me? Yes, they will. So after um, the workshop today, we will email all the slides out um, so that you have all the links. Um, I'll also just include some links in the follow-up email today with um, the resources that are being shared. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. I will mute. All right, I think that we can um, go ahead and move on to Brandon with XL Energy. I'm also gonna put the um, link to the Drive Ahead Colorado link that Stefan shared as well in the chat if anyone is interested in looking at that website later. Go take it away, Brandon. Solid presentation to follow up. Uh, I appreciate the information. That was really cool to watch. Um, so th the goal here, I think, is that we walk through some of Excel's upcoming programs. If you live in Excel territory, um, I think there's a lot of ways that we can help, um, whether it's at home with charging, whether it's with new vehicle purchases, whether it's with uh, charging your fleet or understanding how to replace vehicles. I think we've got a lot of happening right now. It's a very busy time. So if we, we go to the next slide, we're going to jump right in. Um, so we've got some pretty ambitious goals. Um, as a company of 1.5 million EVs in our service territory. That's a 30 fold increase um, as of last year when the slide was made. A um, billion dollars in customer fuel savings annually and that, that fuel savings is, you know, compared to internal combustion engine vehicles, but then also represents some savings in you know, how electric rates work. If Excel is now the fuel provider, there's more volume at the correct times of electricity being sold and therefore we can hopefully push rates down a um, dollar or less per gallon so it's more effective to be able to operate these vehicles and cheaper um, and then the environmental impact of, of, of among other benefits deleting five million tons of carbon emissions if possible so on to the next slide if you don't mind. Uh, so going a little bit deeper into the the emissions right now um, the typical gasoline car is more than twice the CO2 polluter than our grid is to charge an equivalent electric vehicle. Um, with our goals by 2030 um, of, of more renewable and less carbon, um, we're gonna cut even our number right now in more than in half. So I think our, our goals are to decrease barriers to adopting electric vehicles um, including education, which helps create awareness and understanding. Uh, minimizing complexity, we, we know it's, it's not the easiest thing to get some of this installed, so we want to provide services to help with that. Uh, we want to reduce costs. I think this is a really key one. Um, and we can go through some of the ways that we can do that specifically later on in the presentation. 
increasing access to charging for all segments. Um, as Stefan was talking about, the multifamily charging can be tough sometimes. Charging in right away can be tough. We want to help provide solutions for that. Um, focusing on equity and income qualified customers, we have programs specifically suited to serving those customers that are impacted um, by higher emissions and also uh, impacted by lower income. Um, and creating intuitive tools like fleet cost calculators, uh, carbon impact, and return on investment calculators. And then again, hitting on Excel being the fuel provider will help us keep all rates low is the goal, if we can continue. So uh, Excel is planning to electrify their fleet also. Um, so we hope to have all sedans electrified by 2023, light duty vehicles by 2030 and 30% of medium heavy duty vehicles, which I'm sure you've seen Excel trucks all over the place. Um, so these are, you know, maybe how hefty these goals are and we're looking forward to making it happen. <clears throat> so in Colorado, our, our plans look like a transportation electrification plan, which you may already be aware of, split into several portfolios of programs geared towards you know, specifically serving segments of, of our service territory that, that hopefully need it the most. That includes residential, uh, multifamily housing, commercial, uh, providing advisory services, um, and then purchase lease and rebates to, to help to fund electric vehicle purchases and then research innovation and partnerships so that we can kind of fill in the gaps where these portfolios may not cover. Again, all under the lens of uh, really focusing on, on equity programs, including those income qualified rebates, uh, high emissions rebates and the like. So we'll go a little bit more into depth here. And you know, when this presentation does come out, you can go to this slide for sort of budget information if you're interested in how much money is out there for these programs. This transportation electrification plan is over the next three years, uh, 2021 through 2024. You can continue. Thank you. So uh, there's three main market segments served by those portfolios. Uh, people that are charging at home, charging for fleet operators, and charging out in the public. The key barriers, I think, are a lack of awareness information, again, on the residential front, initial upfront costs on the fleet and public charging front, especially, and suboptimal incentives to charge when energy costs are the lowest. We wanna make sure that there's a responsible amount of impact on the grid when we're, when we're charging these vehicles. So that's where programs like our optimization, you know, incentivizing charging at the right time come in. So we, we have a few program formats uh, to serve these needs. And we won't get too much into depth because there's, there's slides later on that just kind of cover this, but um, as far as hitting the, the educational advisory services that includes residential marketing and outreach, including a pretty robust website that uh, people looking for the correct electric vehicle for them, rebates in the area, cost to install, uh, cost of electricity, you can go see all of that and the, the URLs included in this presentation. Uh, helping with community planning via our partners in energy uh, programs and hopefully supporting uh, organizations like High Country Conservation. And then fleet customer assessments, which we'll go into depth in a second. Um, EV, and then lowering costs. This is how we help to save money in these installations. Um, so our, our goal is to help decrease the initial cost of installing EV supply infrastructure, which we'll cover in a second, uh, charging equipment, um, the vehicle purchases themselves, and then lowering the cost of actually consuming electricity. So helping to navigate the process, that's that ev.excelenergy.com. That's where those tools are, but also where kind of start to finish. If, if you yourself are looking for an electric vehicle, that's the best place to go. But if you're looking for electric vehicle adoption, charging, fleet assessment for your business, uh, you'd want to go with one of these EV advisors that's listed here, and I'll show you how you can navigate that process. Continue. So um, going back to one of the formats, the uh, fleet electrification advisory program is probably our most valuable tool when starting to look at electrifying a fleet. 
Um, in short, we're collecting telematics data from your fleet and partnering with you and a company called Sawatch Labs to go through that data, find out not only which vehicles are going to be likely the best fit to replace your vehicles, but also, you know, what kind of dwell time do they have? Where do they park for how long so that we can right size the charging installations, make sure that, you know, we help to keep the, the, the electric bill low and keep the initial cost of charging as low as possible without impacting fleet operations. Um, so that, that's, you know, collection of that data. We can support existing driving patterns with electric vehicles and, and help to show how electric vehicle adoption over the ICE vehicles can do that. And then we can show you where the infrastructure needs to go. We can continue the next slide. Um, so when we talk about EV supply infrastructure, I think this is, you know, when we're ready to construct electric vehicle charging, when you're ready to construct electric vehicle charging, uh, you'd want to take part possibly in an EV supply infrastructure program. Um, this model uh, helps to cover everything that you see in this EV supply infrastructure kind of section in the middle that includes all of the equipment that, that it takes to get from our point of service at a transformer. The dedicated service is owned and, and installed and maintained by itself, so you don't have to worry about it. So uh, the, this slide kind of goes a little bit too into depth of, of the, the process um, of kind of navigating through from, you know, initial discussion to actually taking part in a program and application. But I think the key thing to mention here is that we've launched some intake forms on our website that'll get you with an EV advisor. That person will be dedicated to, to you to walk you through any of the Excel programs, help to coordinate with other um, compatible programs if possible, grants and the like, um, and that really serve as you know a, a navigating beacon throughout the process of what can be pretty complicated installations, trying to make that as easy as possible and truly kind of push for that, that make ready installation for you to be able to replace and charge your electric vehicles. So jumping a little more in depth into ev.excelenergy.com, um, it includes that EV catalog. It, this is a website primarily geared towards helping residential customers, um, but also if you're interested in electric vehicles, this is a good place to go get information. Um, it includes an EV catalog listing of all available electric vehicles, uh, also the ability to compare them EV 101 answers some basic questions. So even if you know, already know the answers to this, you know, if, you, if you're talking to friends and you know, partners in the community that may have some, some questions, this is a really good resource to, to give them. Um, incentives by region it shows, you know, which may qualify for. Uh, a dealership map showing where you can buy electric vehicles and a home charging advisor tool that shows you how much it might cost to get charging in your home. Really, again, geared towards the residential side. Um, if you continue the next slide. Those residential programs specifically in Colorado look like a $500 rebate for home wiring to help get a charger connected if you don't have an existing circuit, maybe in your garage, um, as well as for income qualified customers, $1,300 for a charging station. Uh, we also offer a home charging service where you can use an Excel Energy owned charger. It comes, an electrician will come install in your home and you pay a monthly fee since you don't have the upfront cost of a charger. Um, charging perks and static optimization. This is, again, in trying to incentivize that off-peak charging. So when you're charging at night, times when the grid isn't under the, the most stress, then you know, it'll be cheaper and will provide rewards or uh, it'll help you to take advantage of some existing time of use rates, um, which is the next feature. Time of use rates, uh, again, incentivizing charging off-peak by making it cheaper. And then this is a, a new one, uh, the vehicle purchase rebates. This is for income qualified customers. Um, it's $3,000 for a used vehicle, $5,500 for a new vehicle available when you go buy it. Let me go to the next slide. So again, multifamily, I think our goal here is to try to remove as much obstacle as possible to the multifamily charging scenario. So um, we offer shared parking and shared parking is an EV supply infrastructure program. If you recall that format from the previous or a couple slides ago, um, we'll provide all the equipment that it takes to get from 
our point of service up to charging equipment without having to worry about internal building capacity. We'll design that, engineer that, and come and build it. Um, it's a competitively selected program, but in the shared parking model specifically, that looks like one electric bill getting sent to a site host, whether that's a, a, a landlord, property owner, um, HOA, uh, property management company. This means residents and guests can kind of share this parking. Anybody can go use it. Um, but understanding that you know, that's not always the case with multifamilies. There's also sometimes assigned parking spots, deeded parking spots, and an inability to provide kind of one public place for everybody to go charge. Uh, we also offer this assigned parking, which is also an EV supply infrastructure style program. But instead of one electric bill being sent directly to the site host, we're actually doing metering through charging equipment. So individual parking spot owners get individual bills based on the energy use metered through that charging equipment. Um, most of that EV supply infrastructure work ends up being geared towards you know, retrofitting existing construction. So we're also offering uh, $2,000 per port for new construction multifamilies to go above and beyond any applicable code requirement. So some municipalities require EV ready, EV capable and EV installed spots. If you go above and beyond that expectation, we'll cover each parking spot up to two grand as part of this rebate. In addition to that, um, and I think there's a good combination between both the new construction rebate and the EV supply infrastructure, focusing on um, those living in high emissions communities and also uh, income qualified customers will be eligible for a $2,000 rebate for charging equipment to accompany the EV supply infrastructure to help to lower that upfront cost. We can continue. The commercial portfolio, uh, there's, there's a lot going on here, um, but I'll cover it quite quickly. Um, but the, I think the topics kind of range across each of the segments that this, this portfolio serves. Um, in the fleet and workplace segment, if you're operating a fleet, in addition to the fleet electrification advisory program we talked about before, uh, once we're ready to place that infrastructure and that charging equipment, we offer EV supply infrastructure um, as well as an income qualified and high emissions rebate for charging equipment, similar to what we saw multifamily. Um, community charging hubs, this is geared towards communities charging in right of way um, and charging availability for the EV owners that might not have access otherwise. So this is, this is street parking for the most part. This is available to, to communities or community uh, focused organizations. Um, and it looks like four level two charging stations or four level two charging stations and a DC fast charger and the rebate amounts vary. Um, we also provide EV supply infrastructure for those installations. Uh, we also have a public program, public charging program, which it, it says public DC fast charging, but it's, it's actually not limited to DC fast charging. So if you wanna provide public charging, we can help with EV supply infrastructure. Um, there'll be a limited number of Excel on DC fast chargers in 2022 that's still being formulated. We're also able to serve those customers in our territory that are primary general customers, meaning um, they don't take typical electric service. And if there's any of those on this call, happy to talk about that more, um, but also offering a small commercial rebate. So for most of these programs above, there's a a four port, four electrified parking spot minimum to um, getting EV supply infrastructure. But we also want to fill in that gap between, you know, the residential charging and the uh, uh, kind of larger commercial charging. So this is this is really applicable to small businesses. Um, anyone wanting to install less than four ports will help with a rebate to install the wiring, bury the conduit, put the wire in the ground, and get the charger installed. If we can continue. Um, again, what do we provide for advisory services to kind of help navigate these programs? Because I know that's a lot of information to come at you with one presentation. Um, we have advisory services for residential, including you know, call center, that website, um, an inbox, and some help on our um, marketing material. But then there's also the fleet electrification advisory program to help inform the electrification of any fleets and then also helping with community planning. If we go to the next slide. 
Uh, so research innovation and partnerships kind of fills in the, the gaps of areas where the other programs may not serve effectively. Um, so part of the, the only pre-identified program as part of this portfolio is uh, $2.2 million specifically for a school bus rebate, um, which should be in market here in October. Um, but also looking for other uh, projects in the world that kind of meet these goals of increase and broadening access to electricity as a transportation fuel, um, informing future transportation electrification plans and you know, working with communities, charging vendors, et cetera. So uh, I can send out specific links to this, but our intake forms opened up on 625, which means you can go get assigned an EV advisor um, and someone will call you within a day or two from our team and walk through these programs with you, kind of find out what the best fit might be. Um, it's just a quick like six question intake form. Um, and then our websites are getting updated for our first application round for these programs uh, happening on September 3rd. And you can find them at that link or I'll also include a link in the chat. Also with any questions, you can always reach out to electric vehicles at accelenergy.com. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brandon. And sorry for interrupting you. I accidentally hit the record button instead of the chat button. So no, no problem. Zoom. Um, awesome. But appreciate all that information. Um, and just looking in the chat room, I think we'll probably wait till the end to ask questions. Um, we just have a couple other things to share with you before we do um, address some of these questions that are being shared in the chat. So we wanted to mention that we have two upcoming electric vehicle ride and drive events. Um, we have a residential ride and drive on September 22nd. Uh, that will take place at the Frisco Adventure Park um, in the parking lot there by the Nordic Center. Um, so there will be cars there for you to drive, um, ask questions, see what it's all about. Um, and then we do have the commercial shuttle ride and drive on October 6th as well. Um, I'm not entirely sure what uh, vehicles will be there. Jess, do you want to kind of elaborate on that one a little bit? We will have two shuttle vehicles from Lightning E-Motors. So this event really is targeted towards businesses that have shuttles that run around towns. Think like your um, hotel shuttles, things like that. That's the kind of vehicles that are going to be there available for test drive. Awesome. So you should be able to find more information on this soon on the High Country Conservation Center website. I don't think we have them listed yet, but we definitely will soon. Um, we can go to the next slide, Lisa. And then we also wanted to mention, since we do have a lot of businesses on the call today, um, that we do have a sustainable business program in Summit County called ResourceWise. Some of you may already be familiar with this, um, but the program is free for businesses and open to businesses that are located in Breckenridge, Dillon, Frisco, or county jurisdictions. So this uh, program really helps businesses reduce energy use, carbon emissions, and waste. Um, and to join the program, we will provide a free sustainable business assessment during which we'll take a look at um, those categories, again, energy, water, waste, and transportation as they relate to your business. So as follow-up, we'll send a report with recommendations on how you can make improvements um, and we also have rebates to pay for um, upgrades. So if you did the chargers, that would definitely be something we could help rebate. Um, LED lighting, air sealing and insulation, composting and re recycling um, can be pretty creative with what you wanna do for um, improvements to get these rebates. Um, we also promote businesses um, who join the program and recognize them on our social media and in a uh, annual summit daily ad that we have as well. So if you're interested in learning more about this, you can reach out to HC3. Um, we'll have our contact information on the next slide. I think we can move into that now. So that brings us to uh, questions. So I'm just gonna open up the chat here and uh, let's see. So there have been a few questions that have already been asked that have been answered. Um, I think Brandon, did you want to, let me just look at Jess's question here. Could you explain a little bit more on the residential programs um, as they would pertain to short-term rentals? So we had a question in the chat 
Um, Karen asks, given the large number of tourists and visitors in Summit County, do any incentives apply to short-term rentals? Um, so maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that bars the residential programs or uh, multifamily programs from applying to short-term rentals, especially if they're gonna be used. Uh, I would just, you know, let, let us work with you to kind of talk through the, the monthly fees associated with charging equipment, kind of see if the, there's a, a good business model for you to provide that as an amenity. But I, I think there's definitely work that we can do to help. So if it's on the multifamily side, the channel would be the intake form that Susan put in the chat um, if it's on the residential side, the channel would be the ev.excelenergy.com website, and there's a, a way to contact the EV team through there. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. And let's see, we have a question in the Q&A section here. What interface does the EV DC fast charging station use? So can, can you repeat the question? Yeah, um, the question is, what interface does the EV DC fast charging station use? So uh, I'll jump in here real quick. Um, there's, it's still a very fast evolving landscape in terms of, um, you know, the, the sort of packaging of electric vehicle charging station hardware and the software software platforms that, um, you know, can do load management and, you know, payment processing, potentially even in the future and, and in the present vehicle to grid where the battery can actually discharge and send um, energy to the utility. But there's a number of different um, kind of companies that, you know, are both in the hardware and software space. You know, one, one example would be ChargePoint, you know, one of the, the market leaders in the United States and probably the most prominent in the state of Colorado, both, I would guess, both on the level two and uh, DC fast charger side, but, you know, they, they have their own hardware and their own uh, software kind of platform. But, you know, one of the, one of the things where there's been a lot of, you know, friction um, for, for the EV driver experience is the, is the need to have all of these different accounts and different um, sort of FOB cards associated with different charging networks. So in the past, and you know, continue into the present. You know, if I'm an EV driver and I'm um, going on a road trip, or you know, just throughout the course of the year, you know, I'm going to need, depending on where I am, I'm going to need to have a charge point account. I'm going to want to have an account with Electrify America one of the biggest providers of DC fast charging stations. There's uh, EVgo is another very popular one. And so, you know, keeping track of all those multiple accounts, you know, potentially having um, multiple FOB cards, et cetera, you know, it can, be, it can be a little bit annoying and tedious versus, you know, the experience of a gas driver. You know, you don't have to have a specific account with Shell and with Exxon and with um, Come and Go to be able to just, fuel up. Something really exciting that is making its way into the market is this new protocol called the plug and charge. And this is kind of going to be the universal standard where you have one account that you can roam across networks and you can basically pull up to a station um, regardless of who the manufacturer is, you know, and you'll be able to plug into your car and there's going to be communication protocols so that you automatically begin, um, you automatically begin charging and you know it's it's seamless it'll be even easier than pumping gas in terms of kind of the the user friction user interface bills following up what is the hardware interface for charge station to car for dc fast charger supplied by excel i'll tip that one to brandon and i apologize but can you repeat the question one more time where was that Bill asked, what is the hardware interface for uh, uh, DC fast charger supplied by Excel? I'm gonna have to get back to you on that question. I don't know the answer to that, I'm sorry. D Bill, I don't know if you can unmute yourself or maybe just uh, follow up. Do you, do you just mean like who are the, who's the manufacturer of the charging station, stations that um, 
Excel is recommending or you know, potentially will be owning and operating in a few select cases. In the meantime, Brandon, isn't it true that Excel is going to be making uh, multiple companies eligible to you know, access the incentives? You're gonna be yeah. brand agnostic as long as they meet the, the different you know, technology capability thresholds. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, for most of these commercial programs, we're releasing a pre-qualified charging list if you decide to opt to bring your own charging equipment. Um, and we'll entertain anything that meets the minimum data reporting requirements for our program. So uh, let us know what you want to be connected to that program. Um, and then also for the Excel provided charging equipment, uh, we have pretty limited options probably with this first September 3rd launch, but with those options hopefully expanding through a um, sort of an RFP effort that's that's been out in the world here and should be finishing up mid-September, late September. Mm. Hello, it, this is Bill. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what I'm what I'm getting at is that there are different plugs that come with your car. Mm. Like for example, Tesla's got a particular card, and then there's a European standard uh, for for plugs. You know, what type of a plug or what type of an adapter do I need on my car to charge into one of these uh, uh, Excel DC fast uh, charging stations? I think I'm having connection issues on my side. I, I, can you... I, I, I heard the question. Uh, the question was, you know, what is, is it CCS, Chatamo, Tesla? Um, what what is the, for the Excel approved or um, you know assisted stations? What is the what is the kind of the port standard? And I think um, Brandon will have to correct me here, but I think you know in the case of DC fast charging stations, I think Excel is still operating under the policy where they'll have both CCS and Chatamo ports for their their stations. Um, is that true, Brandon? Are, are most of the DC fast chargers that will receive Excel assistance, do they have to come both duly with the Chatamo and CCS? So I really appreciate the support in answering that question. I, I, I'm definitely going to need to confirm the public charging fee. I apologize. Um, I think that's the case. But one thing that I will also kind of, I, I see this in the near future bill is I think we are gonna to start to consolidate around CCS as the universal DC fast charging standard. Um, right now, you know, up for, for a little while now, Nissan has been the only automotive manufacturer that's been continuing to rely on the Chatamo port. Um, but even they, with their new upcoming Nissan Aria, which is a great all wheel drive capable kind of crossover utility vehicle that'll be great for Colorado and mountain driving. They're switching over to CCS in North America. And then, you know, what's really exciting, I don't know if anyone saw this, this made waves in the EV space. Elon Musk tweeted um, a few weeks ago that he was gonna start to open up the Tesla supercharger network to, to other um, automotive manufacturers vehicles. So, um, you know, Tesla has a super robust uh, DC fast charging network all around the country. It's kind of the gold standard for charging and has been, but it's been exclusive to Tesla drivers. So um, there's, there's the likely, likelihood that, uh, you know, that's going to start to open up to EV drivers. And then Tesla will probably start to manufacture and make available a CCS adapter in North America. Um, to this date, they haven't made that available. So if you are a Tesla driver, you could get a, you could buy a Chatamo adapter for $500, which would allow you to use a lot of these new uh, DC fast chargers um, that come equipped with a Chatamo port. You could, you could put on this dongle, if you will, and use it, um, use the Chatamo port. But I think with CCS becoming the universal standard, and Tesla opening up their own network, I think they will manufacture a CCS dongle that makes Tesla drivers able to use, utilize other DC fast charging stations. And in Europe, that's this is already the case. Tesla's, um, you know, kind of consolidating around CCS. 
So I think we're going to see the same thing start to happen in uh, here in North America and the United States in, in the next few years and as soon as possible, because um, it'll, it'll hopefully go a long way towards combating range anxiety and, and accelerating the market. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the answer to the question. One point I don't think you covered um, in your publicity is that a lot of uh, potential EV owners are concerned about the availability of charging stations and they don't realize it with the proper adapter they can go in and to any RV park in the United States and um, you know get a, a 240 volt 50 amp uh, connection there uh, that'll give them a good charge in a reasonable amount of time. It's a great point, Bill. Yeah, that's that's another thing that can can help combat range anxiety. Um, I did I did want to follow up with one of the earlier questions that that Jennifer asked um, about the electrification of um, large equipment such as construction equipment, and I put a link in the chat. Um, Clear actually manages another pool of funding that goes towards replacing existing diesel machinery and heavy duty vehicles. Um, with, with cleaner technology solutions. And we're starting to see some, some pretty interesting um, developments in terms of the electrification of construction equipment. So uh, Volvo Construction and Case are two of the, the largest um, construction automotive companies that are manufacturing um, electric equipment and starting to, to make, those make those products available in North America. So um, there, and there are incentives to, to help with that as well. I put the link in the chat. Um, Dom just uh, put it put again at the top. So if you are looking into construction equipment and looking at lower carbon solutions, um, please visit that website and get in touch with me. Um, and then that program can also help with uh, stuff for that, that's particular to Summit County. Um, there's even some hybrid electric snowcats for uh, you know, grooming operations of ski resorts. And there's even, incent there's even some, some funding to help with the purchase of those. So um, pretty exciting stuff. Um, also for ski resorts, there's no incentives yet available, but we're starting to see some electric snowmobiles that are coming um, onto the market and they're very exciting um, and you know, really reduce noise and, and you know, the pollution associated with snowmobiles. There's no incentives yet, but uh, I know that some of the, the manufacturers of those snowmobiles and some groups like, like my own are working to see if there can be um, an inclusion of, of off-road vehicles like snowmobiles um, into Colorado's innovative motor tax uh, credit that, that goes towards you know, regular vehicles. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I think we just have another question in the Q&A. Who is working on establishing a solar farm in Summit County? And I think Jess might be able to speak to this a bit. Yeah, thanks for the question, Bill. Uh, right now, nobody. Um, this is something that we have looked into multiple times and ran into a lot of roadblocks. And it's simply because we don't have a lot of land to play with. Um, you know, most, over 70% of land in Summit County is actually forest service land. Um, so that's been the biggest hurdle for us. Michael, who's the sustainability coordinator for Summit County, just noted that Breckenridge does have two. It has two solar gardens. Um, but right now, um, the rules have in past years changed for solar gardens so that people can subscribe to solar gardens further afield from where they live. So a lot of um, our local government partners and some larger businesses are looking at subscriptions to solar gardens in the front range because it's much more economic to construct them down there so that the cost is less too. Um, and as residents, there are also programs offered through Excel Energy that you can subscribe to solar gardens that are being built in the front range. And finally, um, because it does relate to EVs, you know, Brandon mentioned their EV goals, but just a reminder that our grid right now, the electricity provided to Summit County via Excel Energy is about 30% renewable already. Um, and Excel has a goal to provide 85% carbon-free electricity by 2030 and 100% carbon-free electricity by 2050. Um, so, 
wonderful that you are interested in solar energy and we do have H23 does have programs to help people install solar on the rooftops if you're interested. Um, but keep in mind that our, our utility company is also doing its best to increase the renewables on the grid too, which just means that if you buy an EV, your car gets cleaner and cleaner every year as more renewables come onto our grid. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, we have hit our 1030 mark and I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. And I think we addressed all of our questions today. So just wanted to say thank you for all of our panelists for joining today and taking the time to share such great information. Um, we will send out the recording and follow up resources later this afternoon. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Um, I will stop this uh, webinar. Thank you. Bye everyone, thanks so much.